By all accounts, it was a lovely ceremony. Jessica had gotten married. It had been a glorious day. Everything had gone off without a hitch. And so the family was excited when the wedding video was finalized and they organized a viewing over at her parents' house. And Nana was coming over. Now, if you have a Nana, what you have to understand is she probably belongs to a country club. Every meal that she eats have four forks, three spoons. And I've learned you always start from the outside and work your way in. All right, just a little tip for you. Always start on the outside and work your way in. Every bed in her house is neatly made. Her husband walks around and he can barely move because there is so much starch in his shirt. All right, this is Nana. If that's not you, then you're not Nana. But if you're a Nana, that is you. Well, Nana invited some of her friends over to watch the wedding video as well. She was so proud. I mean, weddings are such a monumental day. So much time and devotion and preparation goes in to make sure that everything is just right. Every detail is gone over. You hire people to come in and, and, and make sure that everything it just goes off without a hitch. And that is exactly how this wedding was. And then they got the video. And Nana and her friends watched with pride as it started from the beginning. And one of the very first things on the video was the seating of Nana. And so she got to see herself seated. And they, they paused the video because they wanted to have an opportunity for commentary. And they would just talk amongst themselves of how wonderful everything was. And her friends would remark and she would nod and... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, it was great. And then next was the seating of the parents. Again, the video was paused. Finally, all the attendants walked in. And then the bride walked down the aisle with her father. A very long pause to hear of how gloriously beautiful the bride looked on that day. And then they exchanged their vows and everything was, was going off wonderfully. They gave one another rings, and, and just the whole family was all smiles as they got to relive this monumental day in the life of their family. And then they watched as the unity candle was lit. And then the pastor began to pray on the video. Now, weddings are a great day, but weddings can also be incredibly stressful. And so when you're stressed out, things happen. Some, some people don't show up. Some people come, but they're late. Other people just are a, a ball of hysterics, and they just fake it. Some people pass out. But all kinds of reactions can happen as a result of all the nerves that are going on during the wedding day. And what had long been forgotten was soon revealed for all to hear, when as they were watching the wedding video... The bride leaned into her husband and whispered, forgetting about the microphone that was on his suit lapel, I just tooted. <laughs> Which on the video completely drowned out the pastor's prayer and sounded a little something like, I just tooted. <laughs> Gone was the commentary of Nana's friends. The room fell silent, and everyone just looked around as Jessica and her husband just started laughing, <laughs> only to see her Nana scrounge her face and stare at the floor. Weddings are great, but weddings can have some mishaps, and it's not just Jessica. Take a look at this.
Weddings are a great time. They can be a stressful time. But they're a, they're a fantastic time because at their core, what they represent, it represents two people who are committing to spend the rest of their lives together as one. There is no greater commitment. There is no more intimate relationship than when two people decide they are going to come together and spend their life united together no matter what comes their way. And this is why this morning as we look at Ephesians 5, we're going to see what we operate as as a church is so vitally important. Because in the middle of writing to a church in Ephesus, the guy who wrote the letter was named Paul. He uses this analogy and he talks about how the dynamic of the church and their relationship to Jesus mirrors the dynamic of a husband and a wife. And somewhere along the way, we, we've lost sight of some of this. Somewhere along the way, we, we've welcomed some disturbing trends. Maybe, maybe you've heard this. I like Jesus. I just don't like Christians. Maybe even you've said that. I, I like Jesus, I just don't like Christians. But this is actually a very dangerous concept. I was having dinner with a friend this week, and as we were talking, we, we were flashing back to our weddings, because we're going to be at the same wedding in a couple of weeks together. And we were flashing back to our weddings, and he looked at me and he said, you know, I don't really talk to my best man anymore. And I said, why? What happened? And he said, everything was great. And, and then he met a girl on Tinder, and we, they started a relationship. And then he invited us all over. And then later, it was just all of us friends. And he said, hey, what do you guys think of my new girlfriend? And my friend looked at him and said, do you want to know what I really think? Or do you want me to tell you what I think you want to hear? And he said, no, I want to know what you really think. And he said, she's all wrong for you. You have completely different outlooks on life. I mean, she's cute, but that's going to fade. I don't, I don't think you're a good fit. And that has put a strain in their relationship to the point they don't talk anymore. Think about it. If somebody approaches you and says, hey, we're cool, but your wife is lame. I really like you. I really like you. But your wife, I can't stand your wife. That's going to offend you at your core if you're a good... I mean, it should offend you at your core if you're a good husband. And so this idea of, I like Jesus, but I don't like the church. It's a troubling concept. Here's why. Ephesians 5, we're going to start in verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife... Even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, I know we come from all different kinds of backgrounds, and I know you may have all different kinds of feelings regarding that, and we're not going to be talking so much about family dynamics today. That's going to come in a couple months. We're going to do a whole in-depth look on family dynamics and, and everything that's at play there. So whatever feelings you may have at your core about this word submission, and I know it can bring about all kinds of different feelings because of ways that it's been used in ways, quite frankly, it's been abused in our society. I'm asking you just to put those on hold for today because the scope of, our, the scope of what we're looking at today is the relationship of Jesus and the church. And so let me read those again with that disclaimer in mind. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Lakeside, we must point people to Jesus. Everything we do is not to point people to us, but everything we do is to point people to Jesus. He is the head of what we do. He is the focus of what we do. And so if we ever lose sight of that, then things are out of balance. And so some really good things, some really good things that start out pointing a lot of people to Jesus can, can morph, and they can continue, and they can still accomplish really good things, but if the aim and the focus is no longer pointing people to Jesus, then things are out of balance with that program. 
And so we at our core have to make sure that all that we invest in and all that we do, we are actively pointing people to Jesus. He is why we exist, which means Jesus at all times, pointing people to Jesus is more important than our own preferences and more important than our own programming. Our core focus is and will be to point people to Jesus. And then he continues with this thought. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. As the church submits to Christ, our passions and plans need to align with the, with the passions of Jesus. Our passions and plans need to align with the passions of Jesus. That is why, without apology, we are committed to reaching people who are far from God. Without apology. Jesus made it abundantly clear, abundantly clear, the heartbeat of his mission when he came. He told stories of, of sheep that were lost and how a shepherd would not sit idly by, so, so thrilled with all the sheep who weren't lost but that he would leave those sheep behind in desperate search for the sheep who were lost. He said that when you light a lamp, you don't cover its light. No, instead, you put it on a stand for all to see so that the light radiates so that people from all around can see the hope that is offered, that people can see the light that is there. And Lakeside, the darker that our society and our culture gets, the brighter our light will shine and the brighter our light must shine. We will not hide. We will boldly proclaim the love of God to everyone we encounter. Our passions and our plans need to align with the passions of Jesus. Then he continues, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. We must look no further than our own redemption to see how God feels about us. And maybe you've been following Jesus for a really long time. And so maybe you've lost sight somewhere along the way of what God has done in your own life. For some of you, it hasn't been that long. And you can very clearly remember the change that God has done within your life. How you were, how you were lost, how you were without any hope whatsoever. And how God came along in that instant when you were lost, when you were without hope, and he breathed life, and he breathed purpose, and he breathed hope into your life. When you had nothing to offer God, God gave you everything. When you had nothing to offer God, God loved you in spite of your rebellion against him. We have nothing to offer God. God offers us everything. And sometimes we can get comfortable in our relationship with Jesus, and we can lose sight of what God has really done in our lives because the newness of it wears off a little bit. And so gone is this just this mind-blowing idea of all that God has done within us, and we just get comfortable with the fact that God has saved us. Never lose sight of the miracle that is your redemption. Never lose sight of the fact that a God loves you When you had nothing to offer him, he loves you anyway. When he has given you standards and you rebelled against them, God still loves you. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. So much so that when we were out without hope, in the heart of our rebellion. He paid the price for our redemption. See, the Bible says that there's a cost. There's a cost to our rebellion. There's a cost to our mistakes. 
there's a cost to our sin. The cost of that sin is death. It's a physical death, which we'll all encounter, but it's also a spiritual death, which is an eternity apart from God. The cost of our sin is death. That is us, at our core. Hopeless. With a debt that we cannot pay that will cost us everything and rob us of the very reason we were originally created to have a relationship with our creator that's the cost of our action but the gift of god is a new life and that gift of god was accomplished when god took the payment and the penalty of my mistakes of my shortcomings of my sin and he took the payment and the penalty of your mistakes and your shortcomings and your sin and he placed them on his son jesus who is fully god and fully man full humanity full humanity and full divinity wrapped all together into one person, the God-man Jesus. And he paid the price that none of us could pay. And three days later, he rose again, proving that the sacrifice was approved by God and showing us that we can have hope. Don't lose sight, Lakeside, of what God has done in your life. You were hopeless, and now you have hope. You were dead, and now you are alive because of what Jesus has done for us. There is no greater picture of love than this, that God reaches out to us when we are hopeless, when we are lost, and we have nothing to offer him, and he gives us everything. And so as a church, we have no greater purpose than to point people to this hope the hope that is Jesus, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. And so for those of you who follow Jesus, for the love of God, change your life. Change your life for the love of God. Don't find yourself just stuck saying, I'm fine. Don't lose sight. When you lose sight of what God has done, you lose sight of the love that God has displayed. And the love then that you pour out and the love that you respond to in God's love is you change your life. You don't continue just walking and doing things the way you want to do them. When you make the decision to follow Jesus, you are brand new. And the love that we have for God compels us to live differently. It compels us to share the hope that we have. It compels us to to look at what we're doing and to say, there are things that I want to do, but I can no longer do them. For the love of God, change your life. God doesn't love us because we first loved him. But we love God because he first loved us. And that love should compel us to change. And so what is it in your life as a follower of Jesus that you know you need to let go of? That you know you need to leave behind. That you just keep holding on to. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. It's not. There's a war within you between the desires that you have and the desires of God that is alive within you. But don't be discouraged. Don't lose hope. Don't stop the fight. But even in the quietness of this moment, look inwardly, look at your life and say, what do I need to change? Let me just caution you. If you're at a place where you're like, pretty good, I'm all set. 
you're living dangerously. There's no greater deception than self-deception. So I just want to challenge you. Seeing is how Jesus has changed you to the core and he's made you new. What do you need to go to work on? What do you need to change? For the love of God, don't stay the way you are. Constantly be changing your life. To become more like Jesus. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Because we are members of his body. So I want to challenge you. Maybe you've been burnt by the church in the past. Maybe you've had some really bad experiences. Maybe there are fresh wounds. But I'm going to caution you. Don't think it's enough to say, I love Jesus, I just don't like Christians. Because Jesus feels passionate about this concept of church. About the gathering of people who collectively have followed Jesus. Jesus, because together we can achieve more than any of us can individually. You know people I don't know. You have gifts I don't have. You have abilities I don't have. I have gifts you don't have. I have ability, I don't know about that, but maybe, (laughs) all right, maybe. But the point is, collectively, we come together and we utilize those things as a resource together to accomplish more than any of us can individually. Let's be honest. There are seasons in marriage. There are times when marriage is great, and then the honeymoon ends. And then you adjust to a new life together, and then you have habits that you have hidden so well during (laughs) dating and engagement that she has no idea she's about to encounter. (laughs) And fellas, she's capable of some things you never could have even fathomed before. And then you start to discover these things about each other about six months into the marriage, and you're like, who are you? I didn't marry you. Where did you come from? I married this version of you. And what happened? You have to learn to adapt. You have to learn to grow. You have to learn how to get over obstacles and challenges. You have to learn to rely on each other. And throughout every marriage relationship, there are seasons that are phenomenal, where everything's in sync, and you're moving together in unity, and you're unified, and things are great. And then there are seasons you don't even want to speak to each other. You can't even fathom how someone you love so much could be so wrong on this issue. And they just keep going back to it and back to it and back to it. And then there's seasons in the middle. Things are all right. I mean, you're not firing on all cylinders, but it's not like one of you wants to sleep on the couch every night either. This is, this is a normal part of marriages. And one of the dangers in our culture and one of the dangers in our society is when difficulties come, people are just quick to, to leave. They're like, I'm, I'm good. Peace out. We're done here. That's not just in marriage. That's in relationships. In everything. 
We're quick to quit. Well, in the same way that there's these seasons in marriages, there can be these seasons in church. There can be times where you're feeling so passionate about it, where everything is great, and you can't wait to be here, and you can't wait to tell other people to join you here, and you can't wait to serve and to be a part of what's going on, and you are fired up, and you're enthusiastic, and you are excited about the vision, you're excited about the mission, you can't get enough. And then there's other times you're just going through the motions. It's comfortable. It's old. There's tension in your life. There's a lot of things that you're dealing with. You have no margin. You're burnt out. You're exhausted. And it's just one more So what does this mean for us here at Lakeside? Well, for those of you who are kind of feeling eh about things right now, I want to challenge you to do the same thing that I would challenge somebody who's in a marriage feeling kind of eh about things. And so often we depend on feelings when in reality we need to work our way to a feeling. Work your way to a feeling. You're just kind of on the fringes right now, and gone is the fire for our, gone is the fire for Lakeside, and gone is the fire for us going forward and reaching people and changing lives. And you're just tired, and you're just. Eh. Then I'm just going to challenge you: where you're passionate, where you're gifted, get involved and work your way to a feeling. And next week, we're going to talk all about serving. And one of the things that we're going to be very clear about is we're going to provide procedures for people very clearly to have an entrance ramp to serving and to have exit ramps to serving. And it doesn't mean if somebody needs to get off for a little bit that there's anything wrong with them. There is no shame in that whatsoever. People go through different seasons of life. People have different availabilities. And we're going to talk about all of that. But if you're just just going through the motions right now and you're feeling kind of eh, I am just pleading with you where you're passionate, where you're gifted, you serve and work your way to a feeling. If you are excited about what's going on, if you're excited about reaching people for Jesus, if you're excited about what can occur here at Lakeside, then I'm challenging you, invest in people close to you. Invest in your neighbors, invest in your coworkers, invest in your family, and leverage that investment for an invitation to come join you here. And for those of you who are excited and you've just made the decision to follow Jesus, I'm excited to announce today that on September the 16th, we're giving you an opportunity to go public with that decision. And our goal is to go down to the lake right when we're done and to baptize you there. And it might be a little cold. (laughs) It might be a little rainy. But that's okay. We're going to get in and we're going to get out. And we're going to have towels available. And I'm pretty sure everybody here has a car with heat. And if you don't, I just want to warn you, winter's coming, so you should probably look into that anyhow. But if you've made the decision to follow Jesus and you've not yet been baptized, then I'm begging you, come talk to me. Send us an email this week and let us leverage the change in your life to show people how great our God is. Lakeside, Jesus loves this He feels passionately about it. So let's make sure that we don't lose sight of what God has done in our lives and let's not lose sight of what we need to do collectively for Him. That He would be glorified and we would point people to Jesus.
God, thank you. Thank you for what you've done in our lives. I pray, God, that for those of us who've made the decision to follow you, that we wouldn't grow comfortable. That we would examine our hearts, that we would examine our lives, and we would see, God, where we need to change, compelled by our love for you. And God, I pray that you would help us begin those painful steps of changing. God, I pray for those who are here and they've recently made the decision to follow you. Or maybe, God, they've made a decision a long time ago to follow you. But they've never yet just said, all right, I'm going public. And God, I pray that you'd give them boldness. I pray, God, that you would just give them a spirit of strength. And God, that you would leverage the change that you've done in their lives to reveal the hope that's available to others. And God, I pray for people who are tired and who are weary and who are on the brink of being burnt out. And God, I pray that you would just rejuvenate them. I pray that you would encourage their spirits, that you would inspire them, that you would help them see, God, what they need to take off, what they need to leave behind. And God, how best they could rediscover their joy. And as we talk next week, God, about leveraging our abilities and talents for you, I pray, God, even now you would begin to reveal those areas in people's hearts where they could find joy and excitement serving you for something bigger and larger than us individually. So God, I am praying that you would help us at Lakeside point people to you and you would bless our efforts immensely. In your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen.